order. Has this meeting been posted, Dr. Kiltz? It has. And roll call will show that all five board members are present and our two student board members are, are rehearsing across the hall. This time I invite you to stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Is there any communication you'd like to share at this time, Dr. Kiltz? We have a couple of items to share with the community. First of all, we appreciate everyone in attendance tonight to be part of the conversation. Uh, as our community knows, strong public schools and a high quality of life make Greendale an attractive place for young families to live. Greendale Schools is welcoming more and more students from a wide variety of cultural backgrounds. <coughs> with this increasing diversity, we are working as schools and a community to ensure Greendale sees this shift as a strength that provides opportunities to understand new perspectives and discover the similarities we all share. Unfortunately, we learned last week of two instances of students using inappropriate and racially charged language. While these matters did not take place on school grounds or during the school day, we have an obligation to make sure that our students feel physically and emotionally safe in our schools. Greendale Schools is committed to the safety and well-being of all students. The use of hate speech and harassment has no place in our schools or community. Greendale Schools administration is taking proactive steps to build practices and policies that celebrate and appreciate Greendale's diversity. The Greendale School Board has been involved in book studies and regional conversations about equity. Staff are receiving ongoing professional development regarding culturally responsive practices. This includes how to respond to bias, discrimination, and racism. <coughs> Greendale Schools is also organizing a community leadership workshop in April with leaders from churches, government, schools, businesses, and community organizations to explore our individual and collective roles in creating an environment of belonging and support for our families. We're also planning a community forum in May with a listening session as a first step in working with community members to generate solutions to make our community a safe place to work, play, and learn for all Greendale families. I appreciate the community members who are here tonight to express their views, be part of the solution for the community moving forward. Look forward to working with the community to make Greendale a great place for all families. On some other notes, uh, Greendale High School alumnus Joe Till is Greendale's first dual enrollment student, was featured in Waukesha County Technical College's Impact News Magazine. Joe is a successful graphic designer and illustrator who began his post-secondary education graphic design while a senior at Greendale High School. His clients include the Milwaukee Bucks, and he has designed labeling for Sprecher Brewery. High school students and staff recently joined a powerful training session for Sources of Strength, a positive messaging program that uses the power of peer leaders and social networks to help students find their voice in creating a positive change in their school. Greendale Middle School 8th grade students and Team Inspire have created persuasive podcasts on social issues and are competing in the 2019 NPR Podcast Challenge. The student's work is posted on the Greendale Middle School website homepage and has been entered into the National Public Radio Contest. The elementary school celebrated Dr. Seuss's birthday with different reading celebrations, including a character dress-up day and celebration of writing using Mo Williams as the model. It was great to walk around the school, see the excitement for reading and writing at all the grade levels. Spring Musical Newsies will perform at the high school on the following dates. Friday, March 8th at 7.30 p.m., Saturday, March 9th at 4 p.m., Sunday, March 10th at 2 p.m., and March 15th and 16th at 7.30 p.m. So we invite the community to come out, watch this tremendous production. A Parents as Partners Workshop, Saving for Your Child's College Education, presented by EdVest, will be held on March 6th at 6.30 p.m. in the high school library. College Park and Highland View Schools are both hosting a family event celebrating <coughs> learning on Friday, March 8th at 6 p.m. On March 11th, the Soundtracks concert will be held at 7 p.m. in the auditorium. The middle school will hold an ice cream social and raffle on March 14th beginning at 6 p.m. I know that's a great fundraiser for the middle school. An all-district band concert will be held in the high school gym on March 19th at 7 p.m. On March 20th, we have another Parents as Partners workshop, Safer Choices for Healthy Relationships. That'll be held in the auditorium for Greendale School families. 
The evening presentation for adults is a complement to the presentation students in grades 7 through 12 will hear during the school day. I want to thank the middle school students and parents for being here tonight as well as we listen to their Panther Pride moment. I'm certainly looking forward to all the great things you have to say. And then finally, the following donations were made to the district. $500 from the Rutgers Company of Milwaukee to the high school and $250 from Albert Kem of Graindale to the theater and orchestra department. Thank you, Dr. Schultz. Any communication to the board members that they want to share? Okay, at this time we will invite any visitors for comments uh, to come to the podium. I ask you, I invite you to the podium and if you could please state your name and your address for the record and we limit comments to three minutes um, for individuals and five minutes if you're representing a group. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Carrie Wan, 5623 Beaver Court. Um, I'm here tonight because my fifth grade son was the victim of racial bullying by way of, a, of racist YouTube videos made by his classmates. I'm hoping to bring awareness to the threat of social media um, on the school environments. I would also like to see new and specific policies as they relate to hate speech and social media. I'm hoping that the district incorporates education to both parents and students on the impact of social media. I would also like to see meaningful racial tolerance teaching, not just celebrating diversity. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. I'm going to read something we shared with um, ACLU, the lawyers we had to obtain because of the racial slurs and the misconduct of the school district to handle these things. All right, here we go. I attended the 4 p.m. meeting with Gary Kiltz and the following people, Deania, Dr. Khadija, Mrs. Noose. I took note of the meeting as it transpired. As soon as Deanna began to speak, Gary Kiltz interrupted, stating that what she's been said was untrue. There was no genuine compassion or seeking and understanding from the superintendent. It was clear within 10 minutes of meeting there would be no progress towards resolution due to Gary Kiltz's dismissiveness and accompanied out and I was accompanied out by Dr. Khadija, leaving Mar Mariana and myself with Gary Kiltz. As soon as the two walked out the room, Gary Kiltz stated that there was a lot we didn't know about prior to this incident occurring. So I asked to provide those details. Gary stated that, th that there has been an ongoing feud between Chinese Knox and the same student in the community, and this feud carried over into school which is untrue. We didn't meet the student until this year. And why we're sharing this with people that he didn't even know. The Wednesday prior to the incident at the school, there was an incident outside the school between Chinese and the students resulting in citations. Gary then stated that the police approached the school to pull the students out of class so the citations could be issued to both students. This concerned me even more to as why police were allowed to issue unrelated to school citation to students during the school business hours. Gary also stated Chinese really didn't want to protest nor have the media around because her mom put Chinese up to it and forced her to do it. While Gary was talking, I did respond, okay. I asked if the school had a school resource and he said yes. The superintendent stated the Black Student Alliance had been formed. The, student, the superintendent asked if I knew the history of Greendale. The whole point of this is to state that the superintendent continues to spread lies about my daughter. I have her police records where she has not been given citation. And for you to continuously do that and defame the victim is pretty sad. I came to the school board several times stating this fact and nobody heard us. But now everyone will hear it because this will all be released to the media. 
it's time for you guys to start doing something about the racial tension that exists in this district instead of pretending that it doesn't exist and pushing it under the rug. The rug is getting pretty big. Thank you for your comments. I just want to take a moment to respond and indicate that there are a number of inaccuracies in what was shared there by Ms. Merritt. And you've heard that we are taking a number of steps, including the community, in trying to move forward with a better place for our students and families. Thank you. I will add that I have offered to meet with Dr. Kiltz and myself and another board member, and those uh, invitations have not been responded to at this point. Any other comments from visitors? Hello, my name is uh, Lisa Jones. I'm the co-chair of RID Racism Milwaukee. And I have come before this board um, numerous times, and here I am again. Um, unfortunately, it is because of more racial incidents that are in the school. And unfortunately, what has really the steps been since Sh the incident with Shanice back in September? I know that everyone likes to do careful planning, going slow, methodical, but the thing is with hateful speech and racist incidents that occur, you need to act swiftly and quickly and really provide the support and the healing from the victim. So continually we hear uh, Ms. Merritt has come before you and you hear her pain that still remains and we heard the pain of the other parent here tonight. And I'm looking at a board that does not look like me, that is not diverse, and we talk about diversity inclusion, which is a word that I personally believe has been co-opted, and we don't hear about real anti-racism training. And what anti-racism training have you gotten? I have come and asked that question because clearly there is a lack of accountability and I'm looking at you and it starts with you. That's where it starts. You guys are the school board and it starts with you. And I know some other school districts uh, that are, have had incidents, they have been bringing in folks and doing anti-racism training starting with themselves first. And then with the administration, the teachers, and everything. So everybody has something consistently, that kind of training. This is not going to go away. And I will continue to be coming up here continually to tell you, you have a problem. You have a problem. And seriously, if you see all the racist incidents, clearly the public schools and all the schools have problems because they continue to be around. We just had one you know, with Port Washington, and I could keep naming Oak Creek, I could name Franklin, I could name Bearable. Look what happened, what's going on in Madison? And the activists are mobilizing there to try to talk about what's going on in Madison. <coughs> so I'm giving you that you guys are on notice. You are on notice. And clearly that the group that you have brought in, of the, the consultants that you have brought in, have not been enough. It's not enough. It's not enough. And where I always tell folks is you need to have the people who are the victims of racism and discrimination, they need to be part of the process. And to be really honest, be, be, that's who you're accountable to, are the people who are the victims. And I know that's hard to hear, but they're the ones who are going to guide you as to whether what you are doing is actually working because, I'm sorry, as white males, you do not encounter racism and not really very much discrimination. And so you're coming from a lens, a cultural lens, that you have no framework of coming from. And I ask you again, what kind of anti-racism training are you having? What kind of learning are you having, even learning about different cultures? That needs, and that needs to be told to the public. If this is not the form that you do that in, then you figure out some sort of way to communicate that to the public. 
And I think just the generic listening sessions that you're planning on having is not going to be enough. I went to the town hall that was in Shorewood when they did the whole kill to kill a mockingbird and that was handled horribly, horribly. And, you know, I wonder how are you guys going to do that? And maybe it really needs to happen is maybe the, the community needs to do it because clearly you are not qualified to do that. And you haven't done it so far and yet there are more racist incidents and videos. Now is the time for you to truly act so racism can truly be removed from the schools. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Any additional comments from visitors tonight? Good evening. My name is Nat Godley, uh, 533 on Mill Millbank Road. Last time I spoke before this board, I expressed my deep disappointment as a parent, as an educator, and as a taxpayer that the district had implemented less than half of the goals intended for the first 30 days of the anti-bias cultural competence program presented in November following the racist incidents, uh, the racist incident involving Shanice. We now pass the second deadline of that plan of 90 days and it appears that the plan is still basically on hold, or at least that the district is refusing to consult with the majority of those of us who have expressed deep concern on these issues repeatedly. And then, of course, since that meeting, the community has been rocked by the revelation of two racist videos created and circulated by Greendale students. Let's not use the cowardly euphemism so favored by the media of racially charged to avoid dealing with what these videos clearly are, evidence of racism within our community. I'm sure all of us would have preferred not to see the news coverage of these incidents last week. It's not how any of us want to see our community or our otherwise excellent schools portrayed. But sadly, it was an accurate portrayal of both. Racism exists in our community, and I would suggest that the all too obvious foot dragging of the administration in addressing the problems revealed by the incident last fall, not just the racism of an individual student, but especially the failure of senior, senior administrators to competently handle racial inc incidents of racial bias have emboldened that bias, that racism, and given it license to thrive. If there had been a stronger and more comprehensive response to last fall's incident, at least to the level set out in the plan presented in November, but ideally more, perhaps we might not have all been cringing in front of the TV last week. Perhaps more students, upon seeing the videos on social media, would have known how to respond, would have told their friends that they were disgusted, would have told them not to share such racist trash with them, or would have reported it more quickly to, to teachers and thus halting the spread. But Dr. Kilter's administration, by failing to center those hurt by racism, by failing to listen to those of us who try to speak for them, and by dragging its feet on its own action plan, has encouraged racism spread in our community and in our schools. If this board does not put heavy pressure on Dr. Kiltz, to implement the plan in a speedy and thorough manner and to identify and remedy any failings and shortcomings, we will see you as having failed in your duty of oversight of the district and care of our students. Please do not be complicit in the spread of racism in Greendale. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Any other comments from visitors this evening? And we'll continue with the agenda. And I would like to reorder the agenda so that uh, the work session agenda item 10 is placed after agenda item 6. Is there a motion to reorder the agenda? So moved. Second. There's been a motion and a second to reorder the agenda. Any further discussion? Then I call for a roll call vote. Yes. 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 And I am yes. Motion carries. Uh, continuing on with the agenda, the next item on the agenda is approval of personnel. So this evening we have a, an acceptance of an administrator retirement request mm -hmm. as well as a teacher resignation request, both at the end of the school year. I move approval of the administrative retirement request as well as the teacher resignation request as outlined in agenda item number four. 
There's been a motion and a second to approve personnel, including the administrator retirement and the teacher resignation request. Any further discussion? Can I call for a roll call vote? Yes. 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 And I am yes, motion carries, and we'd like to thank Mr. Mullen for his time here in the district and wish him well. Congratulations. <laughs> Agenda item five, approval of the regular meeting minutes of February 18th. I move approval of the regular meeting minutes from February 18th as outlined in agenda item five. I second. There's been a motion and a second to approve the regular meeting minutes of February 18th, 2019. Any further discussion? Can I call for a roll call vote? Yes. 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 And I'm yes, motion carries. Uh, next on the agenda, Panther Pride. So we will be hearing an update from uh, Mr. Weiss and Ms. Vly uh, about uh, the Greendale Middle School. So we'll ask Mr. Weiss and his team to come on up to the table. Appreciate you being here. Do you need the screen? No? Good evening, everyone. Thank you for allowing the middle school to spend a little time with you this evening. Um, I'd like to welcome uh, Ellie Schutten, Amy Joswiak, Jacob Malott, and George Haig. They are sixth graders at Greendale Middle School. And I want to thank the families for bringing them here tonight on such a very chilly night. And I also want to thank uh, Mr. Ken Norby, uh, who is joining us tonight. We'll be uh, sharing a little bit about their, uh, their project. So the reason we are here is we want to share a little bit of the highlights of what's going on at Greenville Middle School. So last summer, uh, many of our staff participated in some project-based learning, um, professional development, and many of our staff members have gone through the year planning their projects and launching them for the first time. And this year, Mr. Norby created a project with his sixth grade German class, and I'll let him talk about it. But the reason I wanted to showcase this tonight is because it, it served really a couple of purposes. One, uh, I had an opportunity to um, watch Mr. Norby work with his students, and I also um, helped uh, see the projects in action at the elementary schools. But also, the project that they created really helped um, us with our, our transitioning of our fifth graders to the middle school. So it really served a couple of purposes. And we are at that point of the school year where we are looking at how we can transition, right, our fifth graders and get them ready for, for GMS. So I thought this would be a great example to give you a little bit of an idea of how project-based learning has helped us with our transition. So I promised them I'd be brief and let them take over. So I'm going to do that. Thank you, Mr. Norby. Um, thank you again for having us. Um, this is really, really cool. Um, so I came up with the idea for this project um, at the staff PBL workshop <coughs> last June. Um, the workshop was incredible. It allowed me to explore some ideas and make my curriculum more engaging and relevant to my students. Um, it also allowed me to explore ways to give my students the opportunity to move outside of our classroom and into the community. The project I developed goes along with my first sixth grade German unit, which is already conveniently called Welcome to GMS. Uh, the unit includes topics like introducing yourself and getting to know um, some basic middle school routines like class schedules, school supplies, and grades. I decided uh, for the project to ask my sixth grade students to not only acquaint themselves with the people and routines of the middle school, but also then use that information to introduce the middle school to the fifth grade students in the district. I thought this would be beneficial for the fifth graders um, in the district because the transition from the elementary schools to the middle school can be challenging. Um, and I figured that anything my students could do could only help with that transition. Um, since the projects were also expected to be in German, um, students were expected to translate the content somehow into English so that the fifth grade students could understand. Um, my initial expectation uh, was for the students to give a quick five to ten minute presentation and answer a few questions. I thought it would be difficult for my students to get very detailed uh, because they would be uh, limited to what they could say in German. Um, this is also their first exposure to German, I should add that. Um, but I was wrong. Uh, my students took on the challenge of introducing the fifth graders to the middle school in German. Most students created Google presentations with pictures uh, and came to, with me to Highland View College Park and or Canterbury to give their presentations to fifth grade classes. Uh, 
these two groups um, did that. I'll let them explain more about what their project included. Um, two groups decided to give a, a German tour of the middle school um, to two classes from Canterbury, which was um, convenient because the classes could just walk over to the middle school. Um, one group even made a video tour in German uh, with English subtitles. Um, most of the presentations turned out to be much longer than five to ten minutes. Um, what we found was that the fifth grade students were very curious and interested about the middle school, especially after hearing my students' presentations. In one case, on our trip to Highland View, uh, the fifth grade teachers decided to combine all three fifth grade classes. So we had about 75 fifth grade students in one classroom. The three presentations we had that day only took about 25 minutes. But when all was said and done, my students had engaged that group of 75 fifth graders for almost an hour and a half. Uh, because the fifth grade students had so many questions and they wanted to hear what the sixth graders had to say. Um, I'll add too that the question and answers afterwards were in English because that would have been <laughs> 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 kind of difficult. Um, I think the fifth grade teachers would agree with me that it was just impressive. Um, whether my students know it or not, they were uh, being leaders for younger students. If I'm being honest, I didn't foresee that as being one of the outcomes of this project. Um, but that's one of the things that makes project-based learning so cool to me. The students develop some of these other skills along with the content knowledge, not just memorizing information and taking tests. Um, finally, I want to read the email that Ms. Barris sent to me after our visit to Highland View. It says, hello, Ken. We just wanted to thank you so much for the great presentations your students delivered today. It was fun to see how much German they already knew, and our fifth graders were very excited to hear all about GMS life. It was a great introduction for them into a normal day in the life of a sixth grader. Your students were very patient with all of the questions, and after you left, our kids talked about how excited they are to now visit the school and get to see it in person. It was a great idea. Let's do it again next year. <laughs> um, I have to agree with Ms. Barris. Um, I'm very proud of what my students accomplished with these projects, um, and I think it would be a good idea to continue them, um, continue this project uh, in the years to come. Um, so I have. My students here, um, I will ask, we'll ask them a few questions about their experience. Um, the first question is, what was your project? Maybe, go ahead. Um, our project was to help the fifth graders at the, okay. Our project was to help the fifth graders at the elementary schools get to know how the middle school works and get to know s the North and South Star teachers and how <laughs> the grades and classes works and then like how long you have for each class and in between class and what you need and all that stuff. Uh, it was a slideshow in German translated in English by my partner to give the incoming fifth graders a chance to get the feel for a middle school before they actually come to answer some of their questions that they may or may not have been answered in the, when they come to the middle school because most things were answered like the general things. Okay, go ahead. Our project was about showing and telling the fifth graders about GMS and like where all the classes are and like how close they are so like they don't have to worry so much on the first day. When we started on middle school, we were all like nervous because we didn't know all the teachers and all, where everything was. I, th I think this helped them a lot. Awesome. Why did you come up with your ideas? We came up with this idea because I'm sure all of us got scared coming to the middle school at first but we didn't want the fifth graders to feel like that. So we thought this project would really help them out and like give them the idea about like the middle school and that it's not so scary once you fr like get there. And so it pretty much goes like better throughout the school year. Uh, my transition was very scary for me. And so I had a lot of questions coming into the middle school, and I did not want the incoming fifth graders to have those questions and just general things that 
I didn't really know that they should probably know. <laughs> um, when I came to the middle school, I was nervous, but all the teachers helped me. And on the first two days of school for our encore classes, all the teach all the encore teachers went into the gym and they waited there for us so sh so they could show us where to go for for our encore classes and that really helped. I thought this could help them because everyone gets scared when they come to a new school. But if you come to a new school with all your friends and the teachers are very passionate about us. Um, what do you think will help the students transition to the middle school? I think this will help the um, fifth graders transition to the middle school because then they won't be like confused about where to go during the school day and like won't be nervous about and have like the questions will I be late to each class? Will I forget my supplies or like stuff like that? So I think this will help them transition to the middle school and not be so scared once they first get there. I think they will be more excited than scared uh, to transition to the middle school. Um, I think it will help them, help them because we showed them where their classes and rooms are and how close they are together so you don't have to worry about being late because you also have three minutes. And we show them about power school and how it works and like how they'll look at all your grades and stuff like that. It would probably help them because most people do not know where they're going when they start. And it's really helpful if someone shows you where everything is. And what did you enjoy the most about doing the project? I enjoyed doing this project because it was fun getting to work with Noelle and being able to go to the um, elementary schools and seeing how like their layout is because their layout of their school is so much different than the middle school. And so it'll be easier for them to like get places and not be so frustrated with themselves getting there. So I had a lot of fun with my partner. Amy and seeing all the teachers and principals and informing the kids and answering their questions and making their transition easier. Um, my favorite part was going back to my old elementary school and looking at it like how it changed <laughs> and of course doing it with my friends and taking all the, and taking pictures of all the rooms. My favorite part is hanging out with my friend when I was working on this project. It would have been really hard on my own and I hope this really helped the fifth graders. Well done. Mm. Well, just one final comment. First of all, thank you guys very, very much. I know this is not easy to always talk in front of a group. You guys did an awesome job. Thank you, Mr. Norby. Uh, just one comment that uh, you know, hearing this from the students uh, it changed a little bit from our practice today, which was awesome. But what you heard from them participating in a project-based learning experience, which this really kind of came out to me, is uh, life experience is the real emotion. So you can tell that their project was designed around how they felt coming to the middle school and making that transition. The other benefit, obviously, of project-based learning is we saw a lot of leadership and the integration of the skills. I mean, for them to be able to practice um, what they're learning in the classroom and put that right into a project that benefits our community is just something that's incredible. So again, thank you guys very much. I appreciate you giving us the time tonight. Thank you. Could I just comment? Um, I just want to thank all of you students for coming here tonight. It's obvious to me and to all of us board members here that you guys have leadership already at the sixth grade level. Um, it's oftentimes when you get to middle school, it's not like you're considered in a leadership role, right? Because there's a seventh and eighth graders above you. But what you've done by going back to your elementary schools and kind of helping ease the students into understanding what they're going to be faced with, I think is a real leadership role. And just coming before us tonight and sharing that. Um, so I'm looking forward to hearing and seeing you guys more often, um, not only here, but in the schools and seeing what kinds of things you're going to do in your leadership roles. And thank you too um, for your work with them with the German. It's my passion for my favorite language. <laughs> One thing I kept hearing in your comments was a key trait we want in our students, and that is empathy. And all of you spoke about it very, very well. 
So I, th I thought that was a great part of the project. And I echo what Kathy said. You spoke very, very well. Not easy to do in a big room like this. So well done. Congratulations and thank you for coming this evening. Um, I think it's always refreshing to hear the voice of our students. And you know, as adults, sometimes we like to hear ourselves talk. And I think it's always very welcome to have students come into this boardroom and, and get their perspective and views. And I think you represented your class very well. So thank you for coming tonight. Congratulations. Thank you. Appreciate the input. Uh, All right, and then we reordered the agenda, so we're going to jump ahead to agenda item 10, uh, the work session where we will receive the second trimester reports from our five schools as well as our athletics team, uh, department, park and recreation. And is technology also going to be presented tonight? Okay, and technology. You're up, Jackie. All right, I'm here and I'm ready. Mm -hmm. um, you've heard me talk the last couple of times about um, trying to establish a data baseline, um, which we don't have out of PowerSchool for the number of participants we have in our programming. And so that's kind of been our goal to work on it. And we are very excited that we have um, reached that point where now we'll have um, good information for us to move forward in um, future programming, et cetera. So with no documentation with PowerSchool, we worked with um, the technology department and um, entered data for after school, and this is only the after school programs from 345 to 445 um, held in the schools that um, we have been monitoring at this point. Hopefully we can look further to include anything that they do after school as part of swimming or POMs or um, other kinds of activities, but we have been focused on our after school program currently. So we have registered in our database um, fall 2018 and winter spring 2019 programs. Um, we use the fall 2018 platform and class rosters. Students um, were then entered um, in the classes that they had registered in. Once all the class participants were entered, we were able to then pull the data. And um, in the meantime, the tech department had also been working on um, incorporating the edits that would allow us to um, pull visual um, graphs much easier and better. And um, that was done at the same time. So um, the next page <coughs> reflects the um, visualization that was created in edits. And I need to thank Mrs. Amidzik for helping us out on that. Um, she's very knowledgeable and we plan to actually, in our office, meet with Bridget Blask, who's been assigned by the district to help um, create that for us. The results, as you can see, um, obviously weren't quite as good as I thought they could be, but um, this is 21% of all elementary students. Um, that's 237 out of 1,080 um, are participating in some kind of park and recreation after school program. We offer 11 programs, and those are, um, there are six enrichment sections and five more athletic active games. Um, some of the things that we pulled, as you can see on the chart, um, and this is what Edis allowed us to do um, very well, is based on ethnicity, um, the English learners, and so, uh, economic situations. And um, I think that what our data shows based on the school district's um, percentage of students in these different categories is that we actually are having a lot of them engaging in the activities that we're offering. And um, I believe that they must feel welcome and interested in continuing that engagement. And then the last thing um, that we had talked about in the last slide shows that we did um, do a big reduction in the fees for the uh, participants. And we did survey the families that were involved with that to ask if they felt it would make a difference um, by reducing the price, would they have still taken them, um, whatever. And 
um, 31.6% had indicated they would not have taken them if it wasn't for the reduction in fees. So I think that's provided us some very good data to continue to working, to continue working on um, program development, program um, initiatives for doing that. And our goal will be to at least um, expand the number of program offerings after school with a little bit more variety than what we've had. Um, as I said last um, meeting with you that we're very much looking forward to the referendum work that will, I believe, provide us better access to more facilities, um, especially at Highland View and Canterbury, having the separate cafeteria, NPR, um, and a gymnasium. So that concludes my short cycle. Any questions or thoughts? I think it's fantastic that 31% of our community members uh, are in these programs because of your efforts, Jackie, to uh, reduce the prices. Um, have you had or worked on any efforts to recruit community members who could potentially teach similar courses so we could reduce the price even more? Um, a community member, for example, that could uh, do a mad scientist right. class, um, young Rembrandt. We've talked to people, but and again, part of what you're paying is their fan franchise fee curriculum. Right. I know um, Mrs. Amidzik and I have talked, and um, I'm hoping that what we've done with um, the after-school learning company is they're actually looking to recruit some internal staff, and I'm hoping that um, eventually maybe they will become comfortable enough, but these companies have done the... Um, all the curriculum work, they've done the um, equipment purchases, that kind of thing. And again, it isn't something that we can't look to do. Um, but at this time, we don't, the people we have looked to haven't been in a position that they could help us with that at this time. Okay. Any other questions? I just think it's great. The I mean, I look through the, the directory of all the offerings for children all the way up through seniors in our community and I just think you know we're known for our school district but I think as a community at large we're um, we're a community that is lifelong learners and so your efforts in this way to have just such a variety I think are really welcomed by this community and and I want to thank you because I I enjoy going through the book personally and I hear a lot of individuals that I know in the community that are really in support of the programming so thank you for all that you do thank you it's great to see the proportionality. 21% mm -hmm. is better than where we were two, three years ago. Absolutely. So, and we continue to get better <coughs> from there. So this is great data for us to have to continue to guide the program development, program expansion moving forward. So thanks for sharing this out. Thank you. Thank you. Rock, paper, scissors, and Sarah's up. I win. You win. So um, the short cycle that the high school is going to present tonight um, from the academic side is looking at inclusion. This is pretty much um, very similar to the short cycle goal that I had um, previously. We are looking to create more proportional representation. The graph on the next slide will look similar to what we saw um, on my last report. Our initial data this time for second semester indicate that um, better proportional representation happens when we closely monitor the schedules. So that means putting kids in place and then going back through and looking class by class, specifically looking at our co-taught classes and classes that might need some additional adult support in the form of a paraprofessional, really taking the time to go through those and make sure that we're balancing them as best we can. Um, targeted actions I had for this cycle were altering those schedules. We provided additional PD for staff through um, Jen Townsend, our outside consultant, coming in and working with our staff and in conjunction with Nikki Tim. She has done some, uh, Nikki has done some work with, with Jen for our co-teachers, but then she's also um, done some really good stuff with our paras. And I am creating a uh, survey, excuse me, for staff input that we'll collect at the end of the year. And then we are continuing to refine our scheduling documents for students with disabilities. That's in conjunction with the special education department and the guidance department. It's hard when it's behind me. Um, so this graph, it's kind of small in here. It is included in your, um, in your packet as well. Looking at this blue 
Um, last year, the, the bars last year were second semester um, percent of students with disabilities in those co-taught classes, and the red bars indicate what the percentages were this year. So in many of the classes, we de did decrease. In a couple of them, we did increase, or they, we didn't have a co-taught section last year, which is why there is no blue bar. So in the black line is about 10%, which is the proportion of students we have in the um, high school with a disability. So we continue to work. There is a lot of work to be done in this area, and we continue to get better at it, but it's definitely an ongoing process. Um, for the focus for this third short cycle, I will be completing scheduling. We just had our guidance counselors go over to the middle school today to start talking to our incoming freshmen for next year, balance our classes once those schedules are made, gather staff feedback, and then we've got Jen coming one more time to work with our staff in the area of expression. So as we, as we look towards next year, there's definitely, um, I think we're going to see in an increase of students with, with disabilities and really thinking about how we're providing our staffing to make sure that we're supporting our students with disabilities but all of our students here at the high school. Questions or comments for Sarah? Uh, how frequent uh, are the prep hours shared between the team teachers? The goal this year was, that was a major goal this year, almost everybody, there's one or two teams that don't have them, but it was a huge undertaking that we provided. Almost every team has at least one prep during their, throughout the week that's common, um, whether it's the hour, sometimes they might have a study hall or a, a duty during that time, but overall, I think we did a really good job providing common prep for the, that staff. Great. And if I could just add that the, um, any teams that don't have a common prep, we are providing them a stipend because of the additional planning that they have to do. Okay, we'll move on to Jared. All right, then for the world of athletics and activities, again, we looked at this kind of a third, a third, a third. So right now we're going to kind of be taking a look at our data as far as it's concerned with our winter sports now included. Um, so as we took a look at the fall, fall numbers were almost identical as from 2018 to 2017. Um, now we take a look at winter, and those numbers were actually 151 student athletes competed this year, 150 last year. So nearly identical, um, which is great to see because that number is so high to start with um, that it's doing as well. As you'll see in the graphic though, um, what I'm showing up behind me is going to kind of talk about a little bit about um, where our benchmarks are. So that blue portion, which is 26%, are people currently that are involved in zero activities. Um, the yellow is going to be two or more activities. So almost 50% of our students currently are in two or more, and that's kind of the benchmark that we're shooting for. Um, and then if you would look at one or more activities, it would be the green plus the yellow. Um, so right around 75% are in one or more activities. Right now, that just includes our fall sports and our winter sports and about 70% or so of our clubs. So we still have some clubs that are reporting their rosters. Uh, some are more second semester heavy, so we're still waiting on some of that information. Uh, so obviously, we'll only expect this to rise now as we started uh, track and field, believe it or not, starts today. So once... <laughs> uh, things start to thaw out, that might get a little bit better. Um, we have a few more sports that are going to be kicking off next week and then the following week, so we're hoping that weather behaves and those numbers can get up. Um, but right now, the coaches are just working the hallways and making sure that our um, participation and our roster sizes work out for that. Um, so overall, it's been a positive experience looking now with Edis, as they mentioned, within the park and rec world. Um, we'll be able to look at the data in a thousand different ways. I kept it relatively simple because really I want to see a full cycle to take a look at everything um, as a whole before we take a look at it in too much detail. Then the second goal that we're taking a look at was in regards to our student interest. Um, this is just a small snapshot at the bottom of what our survey kind of collected. I collected all the information from our current 7th to 11th graders, just about all of them, 726 respondents, I think, as of today. Um, so we're pretty much reaching all of them to get a better parameter of where we sit for our current offerings and then get some ideas from them, some ideas that we've heard of that I already kind of put in front of them and left it open-ended for them as well to give us other options of sports that they might be interested in or activities that they might be interested as, in as well. Um, so in now in the third trimester, we'll be kind of taking a look and crunching those numbers and see what is our best bet as far as um, the financial side of things, um, possibly per season. I know there is some interest in some additional spring sports. What would that affect for our current spring sports? Of Are those roster numbers the same? Um, participation as far as what they were interested in, those numbers were very high across the board in all of these. Um, but it's just a click. So if I like 
basketball, hockey, and wrestling, I could click all three, but realistically, I can probably just play one because it's the same season. Um, so the numbers are a little inflated, but at least now we have all their email addresses and those coaches can reach out to these kids and hopefully we can find some that we possibly have been missing as well. Um, so all in all, the third trimester will be where a lot of the actual digging and real work starts, um, but we feel like we're in a pretty positive position currently. Any questions? Any chance that the co-op sports can move to be independent? Or That's our goal, and I think it's something that we've been kind of in the talks with. Currently, we're a little low in some of them. Um, I know there's been some talks about the future of wrestling, and those numbers are looking higher and higher. Um, we just That's why we, we're looking at 7th and 8th graders to see, are you also a basketball kid? Are you also looking at hockey or um, some other winter sport that we have to offer here to see? Um, a lot of times we feel like we have really strong numbers at middle school and then they have to kind of start picking options based off the season or based off the time of the year for what they want to do. So we want to make sure that our expectations are re a reality in the future. But that obviously is the goal of co-ops is that we both, both schools get strong enough to separate and then be standalone once again. Can you remind the board, I know you mentioned um, wrestling and I know uh, boys swimming is another co-op team. Are, what else? Are we and hockey. So those three, and they're all winter sports and all um, male-dominated sports, but two of them are co-ed. So that's something that we're obviously looking to try to separate. Hockey is a co-op. We um, currently run the co-op, and it's a co-op of nine schools, so it's very small numbers among a lot of schools. Um, that one probably is going to be a little bit tougher to separate. But then you see when you look at our hockey numbers that a lot of kids have interest in hockey. 13 won't quite get us to our own team, um, but it could get us to probably break away and start a co-op with one or two schools and see how that grows. Um, and then the other ones we're looking to as well. Typically that swim is three schools, wrestling is just the two of us. Um, so it's something that we would hope to build our own strength and then be able to separate. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So now you're joining Mr. Weiss. Lost <laughs> my <laughs> I just wanted to comment too on, on Jared's presentation. I, was, I had quite a few seventh graders that appreciated um, being asked what they're interested in as they prepare. They thought that was pretty cool to, that the high school is looking at what, what they might be interested in in the two years. So um, we are going to present tonight our short cycle goal around reading. And just as a, a quick reminder, our annual goal this year was we are looking at 60% or more of our students in 6-8 that will be above the 50th percentile as measured by STAR. And the reason we chose this is, is as you recall, we wanted to take a look at through the year um, the number of students that go above but also may drop as well. So we're, we're trying to find some consistency and look for students that may drop from one, st one STAR assessment to the next and see what we can do to, to keep them above the 50th percentile. Because although we are making gains with students showing growth, we do have some that show some regression throughout the year. So we're taking a closer look at that. So our short cycle goal for this um, second trimester is our English department and our reading interventionists wanted to participate in some professional development and look to do more individual conferencing. And the reason for that is in the first short cycle, they discovered and saw that conferencing um, had led to targeted instruction. So using what they're learning from the students, um, to put that right back into their teaching and, and strategies that they're developing and looking for more opportunities to guide the reading choices uh, in our efforts to increase the reading engagement. So our, the targeted actions for this particular cycle was um, participation in professional development that focused specifically on engagement in the areas of increasing stamina, vocabulary, and self-direction as well as our English and reading interventionists looking at administering goal setting forms um, developing monthly action steps with our students, and then having the students reflect on their progress. So as John said, um, the teachers did participate in a webinar put on by Renaissance, um, and this focused on student ownership and reading engagement. Um, then again, offered suggestions for increasing stamina and then building back, uh, vocabulary and background knowledge. Um, students were, are able to read for greater lengths of time and with more interaction with the text based on anecdotal um, records of the teachers um, through the conferencing. And then um, all students in a reading intervention 
did participate in a conference with our reading specialists, and she helped develop reading goals with them, and then a plan to progress monitor those goals um, as we move forward. And then we also um, saw an increased engagement through additional reading opportunities. Um, and so some of our students participate in reading with uh, Bloom and Grow or reading to the students and the children in Bloom and Grow. Or also they all, uh, have uh, reading buddies at the different elementary schools. And so we saw um, students who typically aren't um, very involved with the reading or very engaged um, that came up pretty low on the surveys. Um, we saw an increase in that engagement with, with those students. Um, we had a couple teachers that did a quick mid-year engagement survey um, that was done. Um, there's some examples. Can you, oh, can you, there you go. It was a brief five-minute survey or uh, five-question survey. Oh, is that going to be separate? Oh. Well, <laughs> <laughs> right, <There you> so <laughs> to write a story about it. No. Um, so this is just a, a brief example um, of the five questions that they asked verbally, um, and they went around in conference with, with each of the students, and then they got a score based off of that just to see if there has been an improvement with the engagement um, surveys, and the, the, the teachers that um, did, give this did see an increase of a written reading engagement scores. So our focus on the third short cycle goal, um, we were able to get our star data in, and although our stars, um, our, our data didn't change too much, um, we were able to identify um, students between the 45th and 49th percentile to see, um, you know, if, if those students that are in that range would make that one to five percent growth, and we would um, be meeting our goal at the end of the, uh, the third cycle, third short cycle goal. Um, and also our students will then complete an end of the year engagement survey. So we took the pre-engagement survey and then at the end um, of this third short, short cycle goal we'll have the end results with that as well. That's our focus. So I know this just came up. So essentially we identified there's 15 students, 18 students and 16 students uh, respe respectfully that um, fall between the 45th and 49th percentile. If those students make that one to five percentile growth, we will, we will achieve our goal. 60 percent. Questions or thoughts for the middle school? Well, I just wanted to compliment you on your literacy night last week along with your reading. I was really impressed at the amount of students, in particular the eighth graders. I, you know, typically you would think that maybe the younger students would have been more involved with that, but I was really impressed. Um, obviously, I was in a session myself, and it was just really nice to see so many students and their families and younger kids from the other schools coming out uh, for literacy. So I think you're taking strides in other areas, too, that are definitely engaging students. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we had close to um, 100 students from the middle school that were able to check in, um, and those are all only the students that really like checked in with us, but then also that it doesn't include all the siblings that came and that were excited and participated and got the passport, so it was pretty cool to see. It was great. When you take a look at the 15 students, 18 students, 16 students, anything that the team may do differently with those students in order to help them get to that proficiency percentile? So, so we just took the star last week, so Emily is compiling all of the names and we're sharing that out with the teams because um, when you break that out, you know, you might be looking at approximately four students per team. So to be able then to look at who those students are um, and really focus on what we can do to help them make that quick growth. Mm -hmm. So the Renaissance training that you did, is that Compass Learning? Is that, or is that a, is that a, a different program. Um, Renaissance is, is STAR. That's, oh, yeah. STAR. I mm -hmm. that. Oh. Thank you. It was not striking me for a minute there. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Nice job. Nice work.
All right, so for the elementary level, we're going to start. Um, we each took one of our three areas. So I'm going to speak about uh, the culture and climate goal that we're working on at Highland View uh, for the second short cycle. So just a reminder that our annual goal focuses on two of our uh, studer student survey um, questions around students are kind to each other at our school, and um, I like going to my school each day. So that's the main focus of our um, our goal for the for the entire school year. So for the second short cycle, our goal was around uh, gathering qualitative data from our student population, specifically in grades second, third, fourth, and fifth, around their perceptions of kindness and engagement at Highland View. So when we first did um, our student survey and then we did an in-house survey at the beginning of the year for short cycle one, we saw that there was a more of a discrepancy in our scores between our second through fifth graders than our kindergarten and first graders. Our kindergarten and first graders, they think everything is wonderful pretty much all of the time. <laughs> so we focused on second, third, fourth, and fifth grade. Um, <clears throat> and we're working on establishing a, a question set that we'd like to ask the students. So we came up with the six questions. What do you like about coming to school? What is hard about coming to school? What would get you more excited about coming to school? Where are kids mostly <coughs> unkind at school? Uh, when it comes to being, ki being kind, what do we need to do to improve? And when we met with the kids, we said, we means all of us. So um, our classroom teachers, the paraprofessionals that work with you, your classmates, our custodians, all of us at Highland View, what can we do to improve? And then, what types of things do you see people do or hear people say that are unkind? So those were the things we are trying to uncover with our students. Um, so we created the questions. Um, we had teachers select five students from their class, um, a very diverse range of students. It wasn't a particular group. We wanted to hear from, from many different um, types of students that we have. Um, and then we ran focus groups at lunch. We called them just lunch focus groups. And then we analyzed the student data as part of our um, action steps for our short cycle. So the results um, were f my favorite one was what is most hard about coming to school. And it was in this tone, all the learning <laughs> was what one of our second grade students said. Um, but Overall, um, when you look, you have all of the major trends within the packet um, in our, our culture and climate goal for Highland View, but the majority of our unkind behaviors appear to occur during our <laughs> recess period, specifically over the lunch recess period. Um, and many of the issues reported, which were things like not including others, um, arguing over games and, and fairness and sportsmanship in games, um, teasing, we really found related to a lot of the social emotional work that we're currently doing and those social emotional learning competencies that we have and are using in the district. Um, so using those results, our um, steps for the next short cycle, we're going to share out that student feedback with our students and staff. So we'll do that. Um, it, the, the kids in the group really had a, a, a good time. They wanted to know when we were going to meet again. And we said, well, we'll get, we'll get back to you on that. So we are going to meet with them again and dig a little bit deeper into some of these, these things that they've shared with us. Um, and then we're going to meet with our staff in a full staff meeting and share the results, as well as um, tomorrow morning we're actually sharing with our, our PBIS Tier 1 team um, the information that, that we found out as well to see how they can help with some of the, the things that we do in our building around different lessons and, and teachings for, for students with being safe, respectful, responsible, and kind. Um, so then we're going to meet back with those lunch groups and get more qualitative data and, and establish another question set for them about some things we can do and some possible solutions. We're going to ask everyone to be involved in that, our staff and our students as well. Questions for Tracy? <clears throat> I know you've identified the problem. I'm not. I'm unclear as to exactly what your measures are that you're going to do to correct to correct it. The measure we're going to use is just continuing to no, work no. with. What measures you are going to use to try to correct this problem? I'm, I'm unclear Real about much. that. So what what are some steps that you can take to improve that perception of mm -hmm. bullying? Yeah. 
unkind behavior during lunch? So we're, that's part of what the short cycle is around. Um, so we're going to look at some of our social emotional learning work that we're doing. Um, take a look at some um, possible programs or curriculum ideas that focus specifically around the recess period. There are things um, that are available that can help with, with some of the issues that we're seeing. Um, I also think measurement-wise, as far as how we measure if we've made an improvement is through our student survey. We did not give that this time. This time we focused on collecting the information from the students, um, the, the, their firsthand data, the qualitative piece. Um, we'll do the in-house survey again within this next short cycle, and then we'll have the student survey as well. Does that help answer that question? I think just in, in some cases in education, just the increased attention to a, to a topic makes it better. And maybe the students are feeling great that they're being asked mm -hmm. how they feel. I just had a question about the lunch hour, too, and, and maybe this is for all three of you, but um, do the students sit with their regular classrooms during lunch, or do they actually get to pick and choose among? So, so then it, it becomes a dynamic where they're not necessarily in classes with some of the kids that they are eating lunch with, right? Okay. So I didn't know if that was any indicator of any of the concerns, too, because maybe they're not with each other all day long. I don't know. It, it, for lunch, it depends on the grade level, To mm -hmm. Our fifth graders um, at Highland View, they sit amongst four different tables. Okay. Um, and then fourth graders start out doing that a little bit later in the year. Um, but typically, they sit, at least at Highland View, they sit with their classes. Part of that is a management piece and just the amount of kids we're working through the cafeteria. Um, in a, in a given time because it's pretty full in there. <laughs> well, and as Tom said, I think just the fact that you're focusing on it uh, because as, as we know in education, those unstructured times are typically where there's less, you know, uh, I don't want to say supervision, there still is supervision, but it's harder sometimes to cap cap mm -hmm. capture some of those mm -hmm. situations. So so I think it's great, as, as Tom had mentioned, that you are placing attention on it and having the students focus on it too because if they're able to identify that that's a trouble area for them, then maybe they can verbalize what can help make it better. Mm -hmm. so I think it's great. One of our things that we want to want to do too is really <coughs> increase the involvement between the adults on the playground and the kids outside. So working with them on here's some games that you can teach the kids and, and get a group together. They don't have to play the games with them, but get them started on something right. um, and help them kind of facilitate that because that's some things that students have a hard time with. They want to do it, but they're not quite sure how to facilitate it. So just help having that adult help them. Well, the learning doesn't take place in the classroom alone. It takes place lear learning to play, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, so exactly. That's good. I like the way that you've um, engaged with the students. So, you know, uh, as I mentioned earlier, just getting that student voice. So um, it was nice to see what their thoughts were and, and what their perspectives are on things rather than the, the, the adults thinking that they know what, what the situation is. So it was nice that they were able to share their voice. Um, so College Park is focusing on reading this time. Well, all through for tonight, we're focusing on reading. Um, our annual goal, like the other schools, is based on our district goal with STAR, and we wanted 65% of our students to be above the 50th, but this year we added in that little over a third of those students beginning below the 50th percentile are going to grow a whole proficiency level, because we realized we can get up to 70% of our kids who are above that 50th percentile, but we're not always really tuning into those kids who are um, in those lower areas, so that the chart... Um, we have 71% of our kids above the 50th percentile now, but if you look, we went from 9% below the 10th percentile <coughs> down to only four, and then 9% in the 11th to 25th uh, down to 6%, and some of those were the kids who had moved out of the intensive interventions. So when we did that, we wanted to look at more than just the STAR data. So our teachers are using their classroom data all the time with formative assessments, but then we also looked at DRA, which is a one-on-one -on -one reading test delivered to teachers, um, to each by teachers to each student individually, and that was our goal. So on there, um, we wanted 25% of those students who started in that bottom 50th percentile to grow at least one level of proficiency on the DRA, and that's not just growing one reading level, like you have little numbers and they go through, but that's growing from needing intensive interventions to only selective interventions, or selective interventions to on watch or on watch to proficient. 
And of those students, 54% of all the students grew a whole proficiency level, which was very exciting. And we also met that goal with our students with disabilities. A third of those students grew a whole proficiency level, and 25% of our English learners moved a whole proficiency level. And in order to do that, we've really brought our whole school together. Um, we've been choosing to do our, our professional practice goals for our classroom teachers, special ed teachers, um, teacher of English lang language learners, um, Monique, who's here tonight, um, Monique Hoth and Shauna Bartell, our reading teachers, do an awesome job of bringing our staff together and doing professional um, development with them during our, our faculty meetings. So we're reading understanding texts and readers, and those two have a way of making that very real. And then when we have our biweekly collaboration meetings, they're bringing those in as references, plus the other reading strategies books that we've been using. And they're really experts, and we're really digging in. Now we're in those collaboration meetings and going, wow, we still have 4% of our kids who haven't moved out of those intensive interventions. And classroom teachers are saying it takes a lot to move a whole proficiency level. So we're really digging in as a team, looking at other strategies we can use with the classroom teacher um, instruction, not thinking, what else can Sean and Monique do as our reading specialist, but what am I going to do as the classroom teacher? Or what am I going to do as the special ed teacher? And sharing um, all of that ex expertise together. We also looked at reading engagement. It was funny listening to the middle school, lots of similar things going on. We looked at how engaged our readers were with some surveys. And we've assigned mentors. We had 24 staff members volunteer to be a, men a reading mentor. Those aren't formal mentors. Students don't know who their mentors are. But touching base with kids, maybe volunteer volunteering to read some of the same books they're having, kind of having mini book, book talks um, with the student you're mentoring and just taking an interest in who they are as a reader. And that's created some excitement. And then we're going to continue third trimester with that collaborative approach to stretch those students. Um, so that they can all meet expectations and also stretch those kids. We have 23% of our students in that top 10%, so we don't want to forget about those students as well. So what are we going to do to stretch them while bringing in everyone else along and just continue with our professional development and being engaged readers, and um, hopefully we will sustain that we've met our goal um, at 71% with the goal being at 65%. But sometimes we see a little slide um, kind of assessment fatigue at the end of the year after forward exams and many, many other assessments. So um, or we're hoping to hold that 71%. Thank you. Any, any questions or thoughts for Carrie before moving on to Mike? Did you say that the, the students do not know their, who their mentors are? Right. We okay. just kind of think it so we thought maybe it could use a mentor, maybe a little extra encouragement, someone to talk about books with them. Okay. And um, they don't know if they were chosen, but we've we have 24 staff members who have just kind of taken someone under their wing and mm -hmm. just kind of talked to kids about books, people from our office staff, paraprofessionals, mm -hmm. support <coughs> teachers, <Great>. myself, mm -hmm. <coughs> just having informal conversations, stopping <coughs> classes, asking, what, what are you reading right now? Oh, that looks like a good book. So mm -hmm. I'm reading like lots of Poppleton books. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you can get through that in a night, so <laughs> it, it works well for me. But it's kind of an, just an informal, just to see if we can get people excited about reading. And really, if you're talking to one child in a grade, if you're reading Poppleton, mm -hmm. you've got four or five more second graders who want to read Poppleton, too. Right. So it kind of mm -hmm. creates excitement. They love it when we read their books. Uh, I, I, I was going to say, I think that gives them kind of a sense of connect in a different way, especially if, like you said, if it's not the regular teacher they're even seeing right. all the time. So I think that's neat that you're doing that. I would echo that uh, same comment. I think that's a neat idea, that, that mentor program, just because it allows students to see w what, you know, how, how people talk about books and how people talk about reading just in everyday conversation and, and not necessarily just part of the classroom environment. So, like you said, it, that kind of informal, casual conversation um, gets people thinking outside of this is, this is a lot of learning that we're doing. Okay, Mike. So tonight I'm going to talk a little bit about math at Canterbury. So the math, the math work that we're doing right now really, um, really began last year. And we took a look at, um, at the end of last year, we took a look at our success, reflected on the math work that we were doing. And um, because we had so much success, there was, this was the third year of the curriculum adoption around bridges. And I posed the question, you know, why is it we are so successful? 
and um, it boiled down to number corners. As we looked at all the components of the math instruction, it really boiled down to number corners. So we decided that this year, then our focus was in our short cycle goals would be around number corners and the fidelity of number corners, making sure that we were getting number corners in each day for the classroom teachers. So our annual goal, we took a look at uh, the district was at about 82% for students at the 50th percentile. For Canterbury, our, um, our goal was 86. Our short cycle goal, um, we took a look at uh, the proficiency of students on the third and fourth unit of bridges because that's where we would be at in that particular cycle. Um, and to kind of frame <coughs> this out, we're using the pre and the post assessments to help guide our instruction around the short cycles. We're using STAR to see how we're doing based on other students across the state, across the country, as our long yearly goal. Um, we're using number corners then, you still with me? Mm -hmm. Good. <laughs> we're using number corners then to really help guide our instruction. What do the students need? It's a, the number corners is really our strategy to help us reach the goal. Okay, don't worry, there'll be a quiz when I'm done. <laughs> so, um, so those pieces just seem to be working. It took a little while, it took a cycle or two, for us to all kind of come together on that realization, but the, the light bulb has definitely gone off. So um, our initial data showed that in the first couple of units, um, we had about 79%, 83% of our students who were proficient, so pretty high numbers. Now when we got to our third and fourth unit, the percent of students who were proficient was a little bit lower. As you can see on unit four, 69.5% of our students were proficient. So we weren't meeting our goal, but we also, the other challenge we run into is we've only been doing this for a couple of years with those assessments, so we don't have a lot of empirical data. We don't have longitudinal data to say, how have we been doing over three or four years? So um, I think that's one of the challenges around creating the goals. Um, we just don't have a lot of data. Plus that too, when you start getting into Unit 4 too, we start taking a look at fractions. Um, and so that, that always is a little bit of a stumbling block for, for most, including principals. Um, but in terms of the STAR data, the STAR data did show that we had significant growth from the fall to the winter. We went from 77% to 85%. Our annual goal is 84%. Is, um, so we've already reached our annual goal in terms of STAR for, the, at the, for students at the 50th percentile. So, um, so we're really excited about that. But to Carrie's point too, we have to keep in mind that we have to con continue to sustain the momentum and sometimes that gets hard when the weather turns nice. Mm -hmm. After the forward exam, those types of pieces. So we'll continue the, the strong work around that. Um, and then, like I mentioned, really the, the strategies that we're using is really a, a, a target on making sure that number corners is taught to fidelity. So our goal was around 90%. On this particular trimester, we got about 84%. So our next step is to take a look. We're surveying teachers saying, well, why is it? Why is it that we're not at 90%? And then one interesting thing that we discovered is, is when you think about it, 84% really almost is fidelity from the standpoint of when you throw in, you know, somebody schedules fire drills and we have maybe an assembly or different things that will just disturb the daily instruction. If all of those things were out of the picture, we would have probably 90%. But the other thing that the survey is also telling us is what else is keeping us from getting fidelity around number corners? Because that's our goal. So we've been able to discover some of those things that are keeping us from doing number corners every single day, and then now we're trying to make plans around that. It might be logistics like scheduling, that type of thing. We don't always have the assemblies at the same time of the day, just simple things like that, because we all realize how important the number corners is um, to the math instruction. Um, in terms of our, um, our third trimester focus, we're really gonna focus on increasing the frequency of number corners um, by eliminating those barriers that I mentioned. We are also gonna create action plans, like making sure in the scheduling that assemblies aren't always at the same time. Um, and then our third trimester focus will be units five and six, the last two that we'll get to this year on, on, um, on bridges. Um, 
And that's it. Question starts for Mike. Can you give me an example of what a number corner yeah, activity would be? Yeah, that's a great question. It really varies, obviously, by age group. I number corners is a structure. Yes. So math, it, there's a math lesson. And number corners is a 15 to 20 minute activity outside of the math instructional time that revisits and spirals back to concepts that have been taught. And so what it does is it reinforces some of the mathematical concepts. And it, in the curriculum, number corners is designed to go back and re-grab some things to front load for future units and then also to reinforce things that had been taught. So by doing a lot of times we have the 60 minutes for the math instruction, number corners is outside of that. So if it's not happening, you're missing an important part of the instruction for the lesson because you need that extra time. So number corners is not a, a specific activity. It's a structure through which we deliver support for our math curriculum. Is number corners anything like everyday math? Uh, or no. is that structure similar well, in any way? Is no. Something you might be a little more familiar with. You know, you know how especially the younger grades, like kindergarten, mm -hmm. first grade, they did like calendar every day? Oh, yeah. Well, like number corners for the lower grades for kindergarten, first grade, might be your calendar work. Okay. They might talk about within that calendar, and that's why it's, it's amazing to see it at kindergarten or first grade because they're up there and they're doing days of the week and they're doing math within it. They're also doing patterns. Mm -hmm. And quite honestly, sometimes I go in there and I'm like, I, yeah, I don't see the pattern, okay? <laughs> so help me out here. So, they, so it might be pattern work. Okay. It might be uh, counting using different, different forms of numbers. Um, it, it's pretty amazing work. Mm -hmm. And I, I think especially kindergarten and first grade, the number corners have, have kind of woven themselves into something they're already doing. So it's something they already did anyway. So, and then obviously the complexity of it um, increases as they go to the upper grades. Now do all three of your schools, um, do, do we actually do testing at the same time in Greendale? So like the STAR testing, are, yep. are you pretty much within the same window? Yep. So when we're seeing scores at one school, you can kind of look at that time period and say this is how we're doing at the three schools. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then, like the forward exam, I'm assuming you're gonna do yeah, it at the same no time. Choice. It's all within. Yeah. <laughs> we're all. It's all in the same window, but, <coughs> but you have to test fourth grade two days one week. She might do two that that same test two days the next sure. week. Sure. It's all within the same time frame. Okay. Mm -hmm. So. Thank you. All right. Thank you for coming this evening. Thank you. Thank you guys. Great job. And we have one more for technology that Kim is going to share on behalf of Ryan. Yes, I am here on behalf of Ryan. So. Um, the technology, one of the technology goals this year, there's several, is around supporting project-based learning and using digital tools as a vehicle to support project-based learning. The first trimester uh, report, what you saw was inventorying all the tools that we have available and identifying some as being supportive of project-based learning and not. Um, one of the eight essential elements or gold standard elements of um, project-based learning is having a public product. You saw the students today talk about their public product by presenting to fifth graders. Their product became a public product. Um, so we were looking to identify specific professional development workshops that we could offer for teachers to have technology tools for making a product public. Um, so the tech committee has identified four workshops that we'll be offering through the summer. Um, and these are the four workshops that we'll be offering. And in our third trimester, what we'll be measuring is, are we on target? Will this be supporting teachers by the number of teachers that register for this workshop over the course of summer? And then in the future, we'll be able to measure were these tools used effectively as part of a project-based learning implementation or unit. So you can see what those products are. But that's essentially what we focused on was how are we going to support teachers in using digital tools to make pu products public. Hmm. Questions, thoughts regarding that technology integration with PDL? Okay. Thank you. All right, thank you staff for coming. I know it's been a long day, but I, <laughs> we appreciate uh, sharing the, the updates. Thank you everyone. Appreciate your time. Great job with the short cycles. All right, continuing on, we will move to agenda item seven, uh, the 2019-2020 
teacher compensation model. So you have the um, report that outlines what the 19, the 1819 um, compensation model looks like, and the adjustments that we made to the schedule um, to drop the 42,000 as the starting salary, increase that to 43,680, and then also we added the top level at 80,340 um, for the 1819 school year. We have further reviewed that and. Um, in conversation with the GEA, there has been a request that instead of having the top at the 8340, we would increase that um, to a 4% increase going from level P to level Q. So it would be a full 4% raising it to $81,120. Um, I have done some costing on that. I have also looked at the other um, districts in the area and region and compared that and as you know Greendale is very unique in that we even have a salary structure um, particularly with the guaranteed progressive increases that teachers can experience um, through their experience and, and careers here in Greendale so with all of that being said um, I believe that we remain very competitive with our top identified as it currently sits at the 8340 um, we continue to negotiate with the GEA for any teachers that exceed that that amount um, and will continue to do so looking at a CPI increase above that level um, at this time based on the costing um, administration is not recommending increasing that top level amount um, instead just maintaining the salary structure continuing to honor those increases um, with additional experience for existing teachers that are moving through the schedule so why just the last step only three percent um, really it's a costing issue and so as we as we look at the investment that we're making to sustain the schedule and it becomes more and more difficult to to continue to sustain um, that if we continue to increase that top level it will cost the district additional funds moving forward okay but I guess I'm confused these are the teachers that have devoted 16 years to the district and when they get to this level they're being told that increase is less than all the other steps I guess I'm not clear as to why that would happen if you think of it around a percentage yes it's less if you think about it around an amount it's actually more because as you increase your salary right four percent increase or you know, for eighty thousand dollars is going to be more than a four percent increase for a forty thousand dollars and so in terms of sustainability that with this John if we continue to increase at that upper level at a four percent we're going to get to a point where we're going to have to make some compromises in other areas of the compensation model. Mm -hmm. So we certainly can have that conversation, but to continue to, to raise this and increase it at a 4% throughout this, we're going to, it becomes long-term unsustainable based upon the money that we're getting in and the increases that we're putting into this every single year moving forward. We certainly can put f some projections forward for you, mm -hmm. looking at what this may cost us 10 years out, 15 years out. Mm -hmm. And I think you're going to see the almost the impossibility of keeping up with a 4% increase every single year and then adding on to this an additional 4% increase as we go to a level R and a level S and T, right? Because we're going to have to make those adjustments moving forward if we continue down this pathway. And so I think part of this is probably long-term looking at what is this going to cost the district and what will we have to give up given our revenues are limited as we move forward every single year. So, and uh, Julie or Gary, um, our CP, the CPI is quite a bit lower than that three and four correct. percent correct it absolutely is so we're giving salary increases that have been above that CPI well above that CPI. right right 
Um, the only question I had um, beside that was, um, will we change the levels then so that that lowest level is going to be A <laughs> through P, or how does, uh, um, now that we're knocking off the A? I'm actually not planning on making that adjustment okay. because it gets very confusing if you have people who are level B this year and suddenly oh, they're okay. at level A. Um, and so for the purposes of 18-19, I just dropped level A and okay. new people coming in started that at level sense. B. Perfect. When's the last time the sale amounts have been changed? Um, they have not increased. They were approved this way. Um, we made the sell adjustments by dropping that bottom level and adding. We've actually added two top levels since the salary structure was originally approved. It was originally 75 um, was the top of the salary st structure. Um, so, so A through O hasn't changed, those the amounts? That is correct. Since when? Since 2013 when the um, schedule was approved. It was implemented for the 13-14 school year. Okay, so aren't but aren't teachers then losing money as they go up the salary scale? No, because their their increases are continuing to exceed the CPI increases, and so they're getting a four percent increase every single year that they're working in Greendale. And at years, it's level E, level J, and uh, N. Um, at those years, they're getting more than the four percent increase. It's a bigger bump at that five, ten, fifteen as the schedule was originally adjusted. So the increases that they're getting with the 4% every year is far exceeding CPI, and they're getting that every year on top of year. And current CPI 2.1? For, for the next school year, July 1, it's uh, projected at 2.5, I believe. And that's probably higher than it's been in the past several years. That is significantly higher than it's been. And I think this been. year it was at 2.1. Yes. And, and it's this been year as next, low as like 0.12. I was going to say, this year and next year are around 2% or a little bit more. Prior to that, it's been between 1% and 2%. Even less than 1% some years. Yet, the, the schedule has, has been set for 4% increases. Correct. So what would the cost be for the GEA proposal? Um, Overall cost to the district? I don't right now have the overall cost. I cost the in excess of what we're currently budgeted at, which is about for the um, teachers within the schedule right now, moving them to that higher level would be about 35000 in addition to what we already have budgeted. The increase to move teachers, um, all the teachers that are moving within the schedule is, I don't have the exact number, but it's around 300, it's in excess of $300,000 to in, provide the increases to the teachers on an annual basis. And so this would be 35000 in a, in addition to the 300 plus thousand that we already have budgeted to sustain the movement within the schedule. And then also on top of that, we do do the CPI negotiated increase in excess of that 300000 that the district is already budgeting for. So the CPI increase for the teachers above Q, that's base building, correct? That's not a bonus. It depends on how it's negotiated. Most often it is base building, yes. Okay. Because I know that's important in terms of the pension from the Educators Trust. I believe, I, I think it was one or two years that, we, that it was not base building. Um, all of the other years it has been, including the current year, it was a base building increase. I guess I'd like to see, Dr. Kiltz, you mentioning the cost. I'd like to see what that looks like. Projections long term? Yeah. I, can, I can do that. I can give you some projections. I just caution that as we get further and further out, we have teachers, because you wouldn't have the turnover savings realized within that, and so you would be moving teachers to the top of the schedule, and they'd be essentially frozen there, which isn't what would happen as you have turnover and churn within the system. Um, so, I mean, I can, I can cost out a couple years and what that will look like, um, but I can tell you the ongoing cost of just moving teachers within the schedule as it sits today is over $300,000. I think um, from my perspective, I, I'm relating it to private industry where um, jobs have salary ranges. There's a mi mi minimum, a midpoint, and a maximum. And I think from the private industry, the, the perspective is that as you reach that maximum, um, you may not see the, the annual increases that you would have reaching to the midpoint um, or, or increasing from there. So um, I'm just sharing that perspective. Um, 
as well. Mm -hmm. Gary, you mentioned there would be other areas that would be affected. I'm assuming it could be in terms of paraprofessionals. Um, would it be personnel? Would it be, what would you think it would be? I think it'd probably be looking at a, the total compensation package, mm -hmm. and we may have to make some modifications with benefits in order to meet the requirements that are outlined here with the salary schedule. Okay. Julia, is, um, is the staff uh, surveyed periodically to ask about where they'd like to see increased money go? Like, you know, we'd rather have it in benefits or we'd rather have it in health insurance or we'd rather have it at salary. Does that happen periodically? It does. Um, it looks different on, on how it's done. Um, a few years ago, we had a lot of conversation and committee work around retirement um, and looked at the district could allocate additional funds to a retirement, but then it takes it away from salary and what's available that way. So um, we have talked about it in light of insurance and the funding of the HRA is another place that, um, or plan design changes that we could potentially have to make. So. Um, I don't know exactly when it, when they were last surveyed in that way, but it is something that we continue to gather feedback on and, and get staff input on. I just think as the staff is changing over and younger folks are coming in, maybe the priorities are adjusted enough where it's worth looking at periodically. It was very clear in the retirement committee conversations that we had that they wanted the money focused on the salary structure. Mm -hmm. Um, and those guaranteed increases from year to year, and then within that, they could potentially fund their own 403B or their own retirement savings, um, different than us cutting back on the salary structure or even reducing those steps to have additional funds available for, for other benefits. Mm -hmm. How do our um, uh, salary schedule minimum and maximum compared to the uh, district, the area? We're very competitive. Um, it's difficult to look at that top end and get a good comparison because districts treat that differently um, in terms of we have t we have staff that exceed our salary structure, but our existing top is the 8340, um, but we have teachers making far in excess of that. So um, it's it's a hard comparison to do. I can tell you that we are not regularly losing teachers at the top of our schedule that are going to other districts for more money. That's not happening um, currently. Um, in terms of our starting salary, we are very competitive with, with really all um, other districts and our salary structure sets us apart. Um, other districts aren't able to, to offer this type of promised guaranteed growth for their teachers. Well, and along with that, I think the, the benefit package that Greendale offers is, is exceeds a lot of the neighboring school districts. So, you know, to just look at the salary probably isn't the best way to look at it, but to look at the overall picture. Yes, the, the total compensation, and we um, have looked at, at that total comp number um, and have done the health insurance comparables, and you are exactly correct that uh, we far exceed what area districts are able to offer for insurance purposes. So help me understand the process then. We are approving the salary structure, where we will be at the next board meeting, but then there's always uh, the opportunity to negotiate with the, the teachers um, as part of that negotiation process. Is that correct? We negotiate for the teachers that don't receive the increase within the salary structure. Okay. Um, so essentially it's the teachers that exceed the top of the salary structure are the ones that we negotiate with the GEA over. Um, so with the approval of the salary structure, the board then um, when we issue contracts in April, we do so with the salary increase. So staff that are moving within the schedule see that salary increase on their, eight, their 1920 contract when it's issued in April. Okay. But this last year, we added mm -hmm. level Q as part of that negotiation. Not really. Um, it Se came from the, from the, the timing was The timing was at the same time. It, it was separate. Yes, um, and so the the board is restricted in terms of what we can yep. negotiate over. So um, it was through the meet and confer and conversation collaboration that we have with staff um, that they made that request. Again, we went through the costing process and, and did um, add that additional step for this school year. And that timing is typically when the budget, when the state budget numbers are known. 
yes, that and sometimes we've waited for the certification, um, the the election and the vote with with the GEA. Um, once those results are in, then we begin the negotiation process for that school year. Okay, so I'm just trying to understand the timing. So, you know, we're set to be approving the salary structure before some of that additional number, some of those additional numbers are known or firm at the state level or from the um, from the student uh, po the student population numbers and things like that. Um, so, that that may be, in my opinion, another reason to be a little conservative with with the salary structure. So we build the budget based on what would be approved um, with and with what we would issue for the teacher teacher contract. So we're building next year's budget, taking into consideration that three hundred thousand plus dollar expense for acceleration on the schedule. Okay. And we're set to vote on this at the March eighteenth meeting. We'll bring it back on March eighteenth for a vote. Uh, on a related issue, when's the last time curriculum pay has been increased? That's currently under review. Um, we're building that into the budget process as well. As well. Okay. It has not been increased for a very long time, so we've done, um, we've collected comparable information from other districts and we're looking at it and planning forward um, with a recommendation for the budget. And that's $22, correct? It's currently at 22 Okay. Is that including summer school? Or? Summer school has a differential pay rate for our um, in-district under contract teachers. Um, it's at a rate of $28 per hour for summer school um, for our in-district teachers, and then it's 22 per hour for those that we hire externally. Okay. Any other questions or information that the board may need to take action on this next time? I mean, maybe if, you know, I know it was brought up, but I don't expect you to go and do the whole thing on all the benefits and the salary in other districts, but maybe just to give us a couple samples of neighboring areas that are comparable or exceeding us. For their top salary For numbers? For their top salary, yes. And, and I, I wouldn't even venture to tell you to go and check out their insurance packages because I think I already know, we already know that we exceed that, but um, just, just to have a kind of a benchmark, I guess. Sure, and, and like I said, there's challenges with doing that from the top salary, but I can certainly reach out to a couple districts and see what I can get. And, and the other piece of that is, you know, when Joe talked about in private industry that they have ranges identified for positions, that looks different because um, many teachers or many districts don't have a salary structure, so they really don't have an identified top end range for teachers currently other than what existing teachers are currently making. Okay, that makes um, sense. But I'll, I'll bring additional data on that. Anything else that the board may need? Okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Julie. Um, and then continuing on, uh, again, a, a budgetary item is talking about the 2019-2020 school fees. Yep. So we are um, recommending two changes for the 1920 um, fee schedule. Um, one of those is we looked at our... Um, our fee for uh, students that rent uh, an instrument through us um, compared to the in to students that rent an instrument through uh, a third-party company. And we are recommending um, currently it is $75 per year for the L uh, middle school and high school level to rent through the, the district, and there's no cost uh, at the elementary. Um, and we are recommending $150 per year for all three levels, um, which is still less but more comparable to um, if you had to go and rent your instrument from uh, a third party company. So just keeping that fair among wh whatever instrument you're playing and keeping that uh, kind of across um, the playing field. And uh, we also have, for again, for those instruments, as we do with many of the fees, um, there is a reduced rate for the students that qualify for that and then also um, waive the fees for those that qualify for the free as well too. Um, and then the other piece is just a simple piece. We um, work with the middle school, um, realize that the, the cost for the outdoor education fee, now that the, uh, the costs have risen for, for us, um, increasing that from $160 to $175 uh, for the outdoor education fee um, so we can cover uh, the actual cost of those that trip. Um, and other than that, um, our normal school fees, athletic fees, keeping that um, flat, not increasing those. Um, and then some of the things, may the tangible objects, as they get the actual costs 
um, for the periodicals and things like that may change slightly um, as we get actual costs, but at this point, um, we'll look at no change for those as well, too. At the elementary level, um, students start in fourth grade, is that correct, with the instrument? For orchestra, orchestra. Yep. and then fifth grade for band. Generally, when we do fee, fee increases, they're really incremental, small doses. This is quite a quantum change. Is that uh, because we're losing all sorts of money on this? I know you're, you said we're trying to be it's comparable. But yeah, it's basically, um, I mean, keep in line with what, um, and it's a, it's a small number, the majority are renting through a third party. So um, for an example, at an elementary level, they may be paying $200 for the year to rent a, a cello, but then you get someone that pays, plays the bass, and they're not paying anything because that they just run through the school. So um, keeping it um, flat, um, relatively the same for whether you're renting it from the third party or the school. Um, it also helps us to, main, to keep up with um, maintenance and repairs. So right now we're funding maintenance and repairs of instruments, and it's costing us, but we're not collecting any fees to support that. So in order for students to use it, we need to be able to maintain instruments. Right now we have a lot of Frankenstein instruments. That's what they call them when they're mm -hmm. cobbling them together to make mm -hmm. them work. I, I just fear that that $100 a year for somebody on free and reduced, that is going to be very difficult. It's free if you have a fee waiver. And a music store isn't going to give it to you for free if you have a fee oh. waiver. Okay, so if you it have is free, if it's free, then it's it's correct. Free, free rental. This correct. is for the reduced anything that anything that has a reduced. That is if you have a reduced lunch, if you have reduced lunch and reduced fees, then you would pay that smaller amount. Okay. If you have free lunch, there is no fee. Okay. The other thing we can do if the board wants is because there's nothing at the elementary, is making that seventy five dollars, and then making the high school and middle school the seventy five dollars to the one hundred and fifty. So it would be wouldn't be as much of an increase to the elementary. So you're saying, say that again. If you, if you want it, we could look at for the elementary, instead of making, because they had nothing this year, mm -hmm. instead of making it 150, moving the elementary, and that would be $75 per year. So that would only be the increase of the $75, which is what the middle school, the middle school and high school currently have $75 per year. And we're recommending moving that to 150. So instead of, it could be the incremental of the $75 at all three levels. That, in my opinion, might be more suitable only for the fact that the students are first getting into that instrument at that phase, and I, I would hope that money is not going to be the determining factor, but um, I don't know. That's kind of what I thought. These are all the fees listed here, right, for elementary? All Correct. Mm -hmm. so, so that's yep. the total of what they're going to be paying for their fees and along with that. Again, in, in the, in the, the main reason, I mean, it, it will help offset a little bit the, the instrument replacements that we have, but the main goal was to keep it similar to what they would be doing if they rented out from another entity. I like that approach that you just suggested. It kind of is it's in keeping with how we already do the textbook fees where, you know, secondary levels they're more expensive because you expect things to be more expensive at that level. Um, same thing with athletic and, and, act, and activities. You know, mm -hmm. uh, it's more expensive at the high school than it is at the middle school. So, um, so again, the seventy-five dollars for an elementary seventy-five or whatever. Well, but some, one question I have too is: Are you seeing more repairs needed at the elementary or the middle school or the high school? Where is there like an area that? I know I, we're just seeing it in general. I'm not sure if it's what level necessarily. Yeah, I mean, we have a budget that's there, but Fund 10 is predicated on collecting enough revenue. Mm -hmm. So um, there is a budget for it. I don't know. I, they're using their budget and then asking for more. Yes. <laughs> but I, d I couldn't tell you. I mean, that last year we had 100 and, you know, this many repairs and then the next year that. So. Um, that the instruments are aging, they're piecing them together. We haven't purchased new instruments um, that are being used that way in quite a few years at the elementary level. In fact, I know we've purchased zero instruments since 2012. So that means that we have aging instruments 
but I couldn't tell you their repair rates right now. I just know that they're using their budget and looking for more. Can I ask something about, <coughs> excuse me, about outdoor ed? Um, <coughs> there is no charge, a reduced charge on this. Uh, so if, if, it's, if, it's, if that's right, does that mean if you're on, not as well as free and reduced, there is no charge for outdoor ed? It's, this is complying with the field trip policy, which are field trips are self-funding. Um, and the way that they support at the middle school students who can't afford it is they talk with families and families will donate. Some families will pay mm -hmm. extra, you know, I'll pay for my child and I'll pay an extra $50 to go into a pool for kids who can't afford the, the trip. So that it is not free because every child has a cost, but they are, wor they are able to support students who require waivers by asking for additional donations from other families. Do both free and reduced. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do they do that right within the permission slip when they first put it out and ask if you're willing yes. to donate? Mm -hmm. It's right on the permission slip where it says how you're going to make your payments and then if you'd like to donate to another family, check here. Have we had any cases where students are turned away from outdoor ed no. at all? I didn't think so. <coughs> I mean, that seems like a... I, and I understand it will be hard for families with free and reduced, but it seems like a fair rate for, th are they gone for two overnights and three days, right? Mm -hmm. That's food and everything. Some parents might like that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we have... <laughs> and no <technology>. sorry. <laughs> uh, we have some time in this as well, too. We approve this fees with the budget in June, so we bring it at this point, but again, we have time to make some some changes so I I know from personal experiences I actually used to be in charge of the outdoor ed program and it's probably one of the most rewarding programs that the middle school offers and if you ask any graduating class from the probably all the way back to the 70s they will say that's <laughs> the one thing that sticks out in their mind so I'm, I'm glad to see that that continues And, and my only other comment is I, I'm glad to see that we're keeping the school fees, uh, aside from a couple of changes, um, at the same level, I think. Uh, it's, it kind of recognizes the investments the community and particularly the parents and the families of students here have made in the schools as well as supporting the referendum. So I think it, it shows uh, good faith that, that we're trying to maintain those, those fees. I'm, I'm also happy to see that the, the lunch, well, it still says T, TBD, right? But um, are, where are we at with that? Yeah, we bring that um, in uh, April. I think the second meeting in April is when we first look at that. Uh, we have not, we did not raise the lunch prices the last two years. Right. Um, two years ago, we had an exemption um, because we had our fund balance was, um, was enough, so we, we um, uh, asked for an exemption from the DPI, we were granted that. And then last year, um, part of the Healthy um, Hunger Act, um, it, it applied to more districts if you had a fund balance as of January of 2018. So uh, I was just talking to Cindy about this the other day. We have not received any guidance from uh, the USDA or DPI yet, um, but we will, um, yeah, we will bring that in April. Okay. Great. Any other questions or comments? Thank you, Todd. Um, continuing on, the next item on the agenda is the superintendent's mid-year report and review process. So Dr. Kiltz will share with us um, s some of the, his um, artifacts. Artifacts, thank you. Mm -hmm. And then uh, at our next board meeting, we will go into closed session and um, conduct a, a midterm uh, evaluation. So as the board knows, part of the superintendent scorecard includes um, taking a look at the performance standards that are listed here in the executive summary and that ends up being worth about 20 percent of my overall score on that scorecard so we use this mid-year um, formative assessment as a way to get an indicator around those standards you have the list of the seven standards performance standards that come from the strong model and we approved that a couple of years ago uh, when we implemented this uh, this evaluation model for the superintendency. On page three of this executive summary, I've provided you with some artifacts that most of these have links to that provide you with examples related to each one of, of these standards moving forward. So under mission, vision, goals, 
uh, taking a look at some key articles that have been done over the course of the year around those priorities, as well as the Vision 2020 review we did. I've also provided you with the approved goals that we have listed on the superintendent scorecard. We took action on that back in the fall, as well as the trimester PDSAs that align with those goals and provide you with some updates, short cycle updates, on how we're progressing on those goals, as well as the 2019-2021 revised public policy priorities that, that again are a reflection of our mission, vision, and goals moving forward as well. Under planning and assessment, Looking at some of the work there, again, provided you uh, with district services, trimester PDSA cycles, and then one of the items that um, I do with Kim and Colleen is mid-year data reviews with the principals, and it's a way to really recalibrate uh, the goals that we set at the site levels and making sure that they've got whatever resources, tools, professional development to help them move forward in accomplishing uh, their year-long goals. And then the final piece I put in here for planning and assessment, you know we've been doing some work around succession planning. This is an article that was written and provided, I believe, to the staff around um, our goal of sustaining excellence through those succession plans so that they're aware of some of the work we're doing around this. And, and um, when they're asked certain questions or part of certain professional development, they understand the reason why around those succession plans. Around instructional leadership this year, as part of the succession planning, we did implement uh, some aspiring leadership workshops. So I've provided you a copy of what those work sessions have been related to individuals who have expressed interest. This is open to anyone, but we do some targeted work as well for those individuals who have been identified through the succession plan. We make sure to do some personal invites with those individuals. We also, as part of our board work, and keeping you up to date with some of the instructional work that's being done. Uh, we, we continue to build in work sessions around some key reports aligned with the priorities, as well as have an annual retreat uh, where we're providing some more specific work there. We do have some key partnerships to help us with our instructional work. One is with the Buck Institute. So they've come in and provided some professional development around the project-based learning model and have done basically a workshop 101 on the foundation of project-based learning. And then they've come in and done some coaching sessions a couple of times over the course of the year already with those teachers who have gone through the 101 training. And then the other partnership we have is with Ed Leadership 21. And their work is really around attributes of a graduate. So when we take a look at those attributes and taking some next steps and implementing that in, in the course of our lessons and units, Ed Leadership 21 is going to be able to provide us with some tremendous models and examples and support moving forward. Colleen and Kim had the opportunity to go to their conference last year, their national conference, and we're hoping to continue to work with them. There are some partners as well in the region. Brown Deer is one of the partners, um, and we'll continue to engage in some cooperative activities with them as well. We also continue to do leadership and board book studies. Uh, this year, we did the branded. Every year, we, we try to focus on something that's going to help us move forward. We also have been doing some work around social emotional learning. And as we take a look at our mental health framework, as we take a look at that sense of belonging, self-management, self-monitoring, uh, that social emotional learning is going to be important. So we have a team that's actually taking a look at where we are, what our current state is, and what steps we need to do to take to get to that future state. We also have been doing some work around closing the achievement gap. You heard some of the short cycle reports tonight that have focused on that. And we continue to work with our equity team around that ICS model, Colleen Capper, Elise Fratura, and building that out. I've also been part of uh, AASA, which is the National Superintendent Association, a superintendent certification <coughs> program. I've gone through two workshops right now that have been sponsored, have a mentor, um, a superintendent out of Pennsylvania who is a National Superintendent of the Year with the focus on some of this equity work that we're doing for my project. And so uh, that's been a, a great opportunity for me. And then we also did a grant uh, for a teacher certification program with Carroll University 
and with a couple of other districts. Julia has led some of that moving forward, but this is really an opportunity to work with um, some of our teachers and getting them a certification in special education, as well as some of our paraprofessionals to get them certified uh, as an educator as well. So we're excited with that teacher certification grant and being able to move that forward with Carroll University. Around organizational leadership and safety, uh, we continue to do the safety walkthroughs with police and fire every year, almost a safety audit. We also this year received two safety and security grants that we've used to support not only some facility upgrades around security, like cameras and like some security doors, but we're also using those funds to support some of the social, emotional, and mental health uh, professional development that Colleen has been coordinating. We are getting a lot of regional and state recognition for our violence risk assessment process. And so when we take a look at how we're reacting to students who may have some violent tendencies, we have a really strong process that we use with teachers and with other staff members to really identify uh, what level of risk are we talking here and, and to put together a behavioral plan for students who may be showing some violent tendencies. We also have a tabletop activity that we have set up that we're going to be doing with police, fire, and the community. That'll be next September, but we're working through the planning stages of that. We have some strong partnerships with the health department. One is around tobacco drug prevention, and um, Madeline's been doing a great job in running those after-school activities. We also have a strong community alliance uh, that sponsors the Health and Wellness Summit. Um, and includes some work of our eighth graders and sharing out some of their health projects. And then we also work closely with them around notification of outbreaks, which we've had a couple of those this year. Um, and then around organizational leadership and safety, the equity plan, again, looking at the social, emotional safety of our students moving forward. Around communication, community relations, uh, provided you with um, the letter we did around the racial incidents and making sure we were communicating that out mm. immediately, being proactive around that. Um, so as soon as we had the information, we made sure to let our, our parents know um, that that was unacceptable and some of the steps that we have been taking and will continue to take. We also uh, had a successful facility referendum and continue to do planning around that. So I've given you uh, some samples of that work. We continue to have a strong village district collaboration, including at least two meetings every single year that are joint meetings between uh, the village and the district. And then I also make sure to have quarterly PTO leadership meetings. This is an opportunity for me to meet with the president, vice president, treasurer, whoever else, maybe officers invited to a meeting that we do just to provide some updates on some of our critical work and then see what questions, concerns they may have and do some coordinated work across the PTOs. We also had a successful launch of Life in the Village, a community magazine that we're really excited about. We have uh, five different Parents as Partners workshops that hit some key topics for our parents in the community. I also have membership with the Lions, the Library Board, the Chamber Board, and the Milwaukee Metropolitan Association of Commerce, um, all helping, I think, support our schools and provide some strong networking and partnerships. We continue to do legislative advocacy with next week. We have two board members and myself going to the day at the Capitol that's sponsored by WASB. And then we also have a strong education foundation that's been doing some uh, creative fundraising, community outreach, putting in some activities that haven't been done in the past. So excited to see some of the work that they've been doing. Around professionalism, I mentioned the superintendent certification. I also take advantage of uh, the Wisconsin Association of, superintendent of State District uh, Administrators and uh, attend their annual conference, the State Education Convention, which many of us had an opportunity to go to. And then just making sure that I'm giving back to the field uh, by serving as an adjunct professor for Middle Tennessee and Concordia Universities, and then continuing to work regionally with Whitnall, Greenfield, Franklin, through that forward thinking collaboration and uh, some of the work that we're doing regionally around career pathways. And then finally, monitoring the student academic progress 
continuing to do that through the short cycle plans and the district superintendent scorecard. So what I'll ask the board members to do, you should have received uh, an email today with a, a survey that asks for a rating across these uh, different per performance standards. And if you can complete that by March 11th, that will give Joe some time to complete the formative assessment document that we'll share out and have some conversation around at the next board meeting in a closed session. So any thoughts or questions for me regarding those artifacts? I had a couple. Um, the aspiring leadership workshops, what type of attendance was at those? Was there, because um, I know we saw that there were um, staff that were interested in different areas, so I'm assuming they were small groups. They are. They're small groups. We've been getting six to nine. I think at the last one, we didn't have any attend, um, but we have one final one coming up April 2nd, I believe. Wednesday. Wednesday, okay, so coming up quickly, it's on Wednesday. So it's a combined one with, with anyone that expressed interest. Correct, and th this, the previous one, we didn't necessarily um, communicate it out. Mm -hmm. we, we thought people who had on their schedule would, would come, and uh, so we are not communicating it out, and we ended up not getting anyone for, I think, what would have been a really strong session on communication strategies and this next one that we're doing is around HR business finance and we did communicate that out to all the teachers and invite everyone to come and then with the teacher certification I just know with our field right now the, of education is really struggling um, are there any thoughts or locally of any education fairs that are um, in the process I, I know oftentimes Milwaukee has something but are any of the suburbs talking about something like that? CISA 1 always sponsors uh, teacher fair every single year. Julie and some other team members go to Madison okay. for the recruitment fair there. Good. That was recent too, wasn't that? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. We, we also have an educators rising organization, student organization that started up this year. And I think it's been mentioned that we have students right now, 10 students I believe it is, going through a course that we're offering and it's it's actually a dual enrollment course where they're getting credit through UWM. We actually, as part of that Educators Rising program, we have a, um, what are we calling it? A signature? A pledge to a prosper. Pledge to prosper. prosper. Do you wanna talk a little so bit about that? Similar to athletic scholarship signings um, and signing day, tomorrow morning um, we'll be meeting with six five of the teachers that are or students that are enrolled um, in the Educators Rising Club um, and they will be signing a pledge to prosper that upon graduation um, with a degree in education we are extending them an invitation to interview um, with the district when they've completed their bachelor's degree and would be eligible for a teaching position so um, they'll they're coming in tomorrow with their families to sign um, with Dr. Kiltz. So we're excited. We're excited to have that opportunity for our students. We also have two, um, actually one of the students is attending the Educators Rising um, Conference. In, it's hosted at UW Oshkosh um, March 20th, I believe. Um, I'm also attending with the advisor for the club. Um, and they have different competitions that the student will be participating in um, and just learning more about the career um, and pathways to is there any chance we could hear from I don't I don't want to put the pressure on or anything but from that student or students involved at some point we could actually do like a Panther pride yeah. opportunity and cool. invite sure. those students to come in probably towards the end of their semester and just get some feedback on how the course went mm -hmm. and um, what their hopes aspirations are awesome. I have another question. If oh, please. I, I don't want to be the only one. Anyone else? Um, so you, what, the membership with MMAC, what is that again? So basically what MMAC is, um, they're an organization that serves all of the chambers of commerce. Okay. And so they have sort of a broader perspective on workforce development, the economics, um, economic prosperity in the region. Okay. One of the items that they've been um, sponsoring is uh, an avenue to promote business school district partnerships and so we've been working with them to try to launch some of that work as part of our career pathways the, the problem is 
it hasn't necessarily caught on with businesses. So we don't have a lot of businesses that are using the uh, digital platform to share um, who they are and what opportunities may be available for students and staff to integrate into their curriculum. And so without um, a more robust pool of businesses in that, it's or you're sort of left on your own to try to figure some of this out. So it just hasn't caught caught on as well as we would have thought it's it metropolitan, had. Metropolitan, what does it uh, stand for again? Um, metropolitan Milwaukee, Milwaukee, Milwaukee Associations of Commerce, MMAC. Okay. All right, any other questions? seven performance standards. I really appreciate all the documentation. Yeah, oh, this is great. Very good. Yeah. It makes You're it welcome. organize the a lot more out of it that way. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I think it's important that we share this in, a, in an open session. You know, this this shows the community the, the breadth and the scope of, of the role. Um, you know, there are always people who have a, an issue or a concern, um, but I think overall you, you see the, the breadth and the scope that, that uh, comes with the role, so thank you for sharing this. It, I didn't see it on there, but um, we're also part of the Closing the Achievement Gap, um, right, the consortium? Was, yeah, Is that I on think there? that was it's oh, part it's of in here under instructional, instructional leadership. leadership. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Then I just missed it. Put the glasses on. <laughs> there it is. Okay. With ICS. Yep. Thank you. All right, then we will, um, like I said, use this to go into a closed session for the evaluation at our next board meeting. All right, then we are at the end of our agenda. Any additional questions or comments from visitors this evening? All right, seeing none, we are adjourned until our next board meeting, uh, which is March 18th at 7 p.m. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.